Do you want me to do it in French? Because I can't do the whole thing in French. It's like the worst episode of Long Lost Family you've ever seen. In <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, you're quite good at this, David. So, like, do, you feel you're, do you feel you're getting like, you're like, oh, I'm actually here. You know, I'm getting a wee bit of an you know expert is? interviewer. I, I really enjoy it. What you want to book for radio is good talkers. Yeah. People who can talk. People who are relaxed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Diane, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me, and what an intro. Well, that's all right, we try, we try. <laughs> it's all true, and it's all true. I haven't made any of that up. I can make a bit of a film or two. Where would I start? I love the way you said one or two things have been happening in the last year. I mean, it's been an absolute roller coaster. I was doing so many technology stories, they decided to call me technology correspondent. I am surrounded, in fact, I'm surrounded by Lego mechs, um, among other things, because my husband is in a meeting downstairs and I think that he's, he's decided his meeting is more important. You with this guy in Greece and he, he was Greek? Uh, no, so he was actually Welsh. Um, oh, okay. Yes. I thought, well, if I write a book, then more people will hear about me and I'll be invited kindly on podcasts like this. In this episode of the Insight Podcast from HRA Source, we meet Joe Mullings. Joe is the chairman and CEO of the Mullings Group Companies. He's also in Florida and he is in a number of other parts of the world. His companies have grown very quickly, and he has been all about building companies and building careers at the same time, because he's all about recruitment and search and connecting with organizations that are seeking to hire the best talent. And he's very good at that job, but he's also very good at spotting talent within his own organization and developing those to be able to meet the needs of his clients. He works to the four pillars, which we'll touch on in this conversation four areas of business in which he finds it essential to be able to connect with those clients and deliver exactly what they need. This is a podcast where you'll understand how being the educator in a situation can often be the best way to provide a solution. Even though the client may not have initially thought that they needed educating, there is a way in which an organisation such as the Mullings Group can deliver. And boy, are they delivering. You'll enjoy this one. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the Insight podcast with HR Resource, uh, the CEO and chairman of the Mullings Group of Companies. Uh, Welcome, Joe. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. And it's good to connect with you on the other side of the lake, where we have some presence as well. So it's a little like home to me there. I noticed that we're just talking about Newcastle and uh, and common threads there and common career paths, um, certainly for me. Uh, and on on a note today, which is quite interesting, we I don't know what the temperature is over there in Florida. It's a bit early in the morning for you, but it's but it's it's thirty degrees here, which uh, from where we're recording from is is almost unheard of. But we are going through the climate change thing, which uh, which is certainly having effect in in what was previously known as the frozen north. Um, <laughs> Joe, I mean, what we like to do on the podcast is is get to know our guests, and and for those who don't have the advantage of doing what um, podcast hosts try to do their best of, which is do a bit of research, could you give me a little bit of an insight into into Joe? Um, perhaps from I don't know, this is t- just back a couple of years to elementary school, maybe, and and <laughs> and sort of like take us maybe a bit further on. Just did you have any influences that that, that sort of you can still recall that thought, well, this has made Joe Mullings, who he is today, because yeah, so so I, I'm uh, I'm from New York, Long Island, a town called Hicksville, um, and uh, I spent uh, my early years there. Went to school in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, and be, uh, got an engineering degree. I think you're always born an engineer; you just declare it with a degree at university. I don't think anybody says, "Huh, I might try engineering." I think it's viscerally embedded in you, and you start there, and away you go. Uh, spent a few years. Uh, developing target acquisition systems for the military, uh, realized I was not a big company person. Okay. And um, then got into headhunting in uh, December of 1989, worked for somebody for about two years, served a, a proper apprenticeship with them, and then went and opened up my own firm down in Miami, Florida in 1992. Uh, and we've specialized in a very um, deliberate environment and industry, the medical device industry. Right. And... Um, 
Since then, uh, we've become the dominant search firm in the world in that space, uh, with more than 8,000 successful uh, assignments uh, completed. With what, what actually directed you into that area, particularly? What, what was yeah, in the um, gosh, you know, so what I thought was barrier to entry. So I always think about that barrier to entry, what, what's hard to replicate. So that's one. And, and, and that's a really difficult because you have to worry about disease states, therapies, physiology, and then all the functional roles as you build out an organization that are in there. So that's one. But yeah. the other side, you've got to look at a market that has, as, as I tell people when they're designing their careers and making career decisions, I, you have to serve the surf the person you are today, but you also have to serve the future person five years from now. And does the market that you're making a decision to go into have legs? Does the product or service you're making a decision to go into have legs? And then do the people you're going to surround yourself, um, are they going to make you the best version of yourself you can? So with that, we looked at med tech and I said, okay, worldwide, the population's getting older. Worldwide, they just don't want to get older. They want to live a healthier, better life. Um, at least in the USA, there's a governing body over it. So it could never grow too fast because anything that grows too fast crashes even faster. So the FDA has an oversight on it that allows for six to 8% growth every year, but there are micro markets within it that grow at 20 to 25%. And we always identify those micro markets. And then finally, a new technology would always seek a higher ground in that area. So when we put all that together and the big barrier to entry, I knew my lift on training and development had to be best in class. And I knew that most other people don't like to do hard things. So I'd have my only competition would be incompetence in hiring. So I would only have to educate organizations how to find the best talent in the world. I'd never have to worry about other search firms competing with me. So that's how I got into that. Wow. So I think you've taken the engineer's approach to, to business in effect. Yes. I, hear, I hear this a lot. You know, there are people that think they're born entrepreneurs or those that go to take an MBA and think they pop out of an MBA and think, oh, well, I'm a ready-made half-baked, not half-baked, but ready-made out of the wrapper uh, uh, entrepreneur. And it, it doesn't really work like that, does it? I mean, you've, you've, got, you've, got, to, you've got some innate skills. And I, I guess what you were doing is you were spotting trends. In, in marketplace and and do you would you agree that that's something can you teach somebody how to spot a trend can you because that's something you can pass on to your to your team there is it in a succession way or is that something you just think was you have to find somebody with those skills well it's a great question and i think it's where a lot of the world is going today right so it's called pattern recognition it's also predictive analytics if you think about artificial intelligence today and you know in the us here we have um we have uh, a platform actually came out of Israel, I think, called Waze, which is, uh, you know, it'll tell you where the traffic is. You put it in a destination where you want to go. Yeah, so you have it. Yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, that's something that is taking all kinds of data, giving a pattern and giving you help in making a decision. And whenever, when you first got Waze and you said, no, 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 I know a faster way. Invariably, you got screwed because yeah. Waze knew it took data. So I think if you take data and you understand how to parse data, and you go into it as unbiased as possible, and then that outcome is something that does motivate you to do as an entrepreneur, um, then I think you take some of that innate skills, you can see patterns quicker. You know, we all have these algorithms in our head. You have a law background. You could hear a discussion, an argument coming up, and you already knew way beforehand where that adversary was gonna take that argument and you then started putting pre-frame traps in there for them. It's the same thing. It's how much attention do you pay at the pure data retrospectively and then prospectively? And then what are the hints along the way that allow you to see it before it appears? Yeah, and it's one of the things that um, I think starts from a very early point, doesn't it, in your, in your life and your career, yeah. which direction you're going to take. Because I've I've had direct experience of being in a room with a lot of young people. Um, you'd call, you know, towards the end of high school in the, in the states, um, sixth form college, and they would say they knew exactly what they wanted to do by way of a career, which I found quite scary because I was still working myself out in my mid twenties and late twenties. Some might say still now, but but you get to that point where you think, well, actually, I might have you, you you get into a role. You might fall into it. It might be by design but you end up doing a job that you feel, oh, I've got a bit of aptitude for this. And I quite like it. 
and that breeds you talked about the motivation that breeds that enthusiasm to want to learn and if you if you have that enthusiasm and that innate sense of connection you're going to you're going to take it from strength to strength which is you know exactly what you're explaining there it's 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 the way to go forward it worries me when i see people out of the university um roots thinking they're going to take a degree because they want that degree to be the one that pays them the best salary yes yes and and they end up being miserable and what's interesting too is the people who are held hostage look you're 16 17 18 in in in, in the uk and the us when you s sort of make your decision to go to university and that's the point in time where you know the least about yourself. And so you're making this massive decision or you're being influenced by your parents who are yeah. living through you. So when they go to a cocktail party, they can say he or she's going to Oxford, not really caring what you're going to do. And so I, I think too many people are held hostage more. So I think at an early age, having a commitment about what you know, you don't want to do and, and not what you don't want to do from a career, yeah. because this is where brilliant people break away from the crowd is, you know, brilliant surgeons have broken away. Brilliant attorneys have broken away. Brilliant business people have broken away. Whether Whatever your opinion from a, huma a humanity perspective on somebody like Elon Musk is, you have to admire him because people realize what they like to do and then those who realize what they like to do and then can put it into a profession that creates a dislocating thought process that allows you not to be the same as the others i think is real that where, where the power is yeah 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 the power of difference i think it's, it's absolutely the power of declaring yourself and doing what resonates within you like viscerally resonates that you don't want to do anything else other than that, and everything you look at in your life, even when you're not at work, you run through a filter of possibility of how in an analogous environment can I apply that to my career? And then that's where these creative sort of sprints come. Yeah. And then suddenly you keep on compounding that over a few years and you become a genius in your category. Absolutely right. And, and on that road to becoming a genius, Joe, uh, what challenges have you found? What, what things have you, have you come across that have been one of your biggest barriers? Thinking I knew it all way too early in my life. Yeah. Thinking yeah. I knew it all and being a little, um, having an ideology about the, the, the business I'm in, the search business, my first couple of years, I said, this is the way it is. I can teach this. Let's put it in a box. And then since then, We've introduced a stimulus and other products and other people, creatives. You know, I also didn't mention we own a production company, a media company. Well, listen, um, you, take me through that, Joe. Take me through yeah. the, the, the Mullings Group, because I think we're at that point. It'd be great to understand a little bit. I'm sure the, the, the guys tuning into this would like to know more about your companies. Yeah, so the companies are search firm, consulting company, media company, production company. Um, and what we've done is about... Uh, Gosh, four years ago now, I should know those dates because we just went through a timeline. About four years ago, we created a full media company. Uh, we're the only search firm in the world that has one at this scale, especially. Certainly some have some movie cameras, but you know, we've got a full-blown production company. TMG 360? TMG 360 is my media company. Dragonfly yeah. Stories is my production company. Okay, okay. And so, you know, the media company is what deploys the content and works with the client. Dragonfly Stories and 160 Studios are the production company and the production facility. And we took a, an approach a number of years ago uh, from a, another brilliant thinker, Anthony Bourdain. When you think of parts unknown, Bourdain traveled the world, he, he smuggled was, it, gosh. smuggled it under food, but it was people, places, and stories that he smuggled it under the food concept and put beautiful cinematography and storytelling on the screen that we've never seen before. So we did that. We put together a world-class team and we've traveled around the world, Israel, the UK, Germany, and have told these stories about these inventors and these brilliant thinkers in med tech. And if you go to truefuture.tv, um, we're a seven time telly award winning uh, organization and tellies are the online Oscars and Emmy awards. Uh, and we had no experience zero experience in making movies. Well, I did. And my team is brilliant. Um, and through that, we've channeled that over to the world of talent access, and we've disrupted the entire community.
That's incredible. And actually, I've tuned in to a couple of your shows. Um, I was watching the interview with the um, the guy in Israel and uh, how he yeah. was he was saying how Israel's got to reposition itself in terms of its short termism and thinking about they're only creating businesses to be quickly sold on and the lessons they could learn from Silicon Valley. It's fascinating yeah. stuff. And what I really liked about it, um, about my short attention span, but it's it's short packages, isn't it? A lot of it. 13 minutes, 13 to 14 minutes, uh, just giving you that quick hit, yeah. get you hooked. Again, beautiful cinematography, great characters, beautiful storytelling, and things that um, seem unthinkable that you can then take to your kitchen table and with your mom or your grandmother, sit there and explain it to her, and she watches it, and she's like, huh, that's interesting, which is what our goal was. No, it's they are really, really well, very well done. Thank and you. one of the things that um, I think that helps the position as well, I'm going to be a bit cheeky with this, but if you're talking to these leading uh, med tech individuals around the globe. Um, not a bad positioning statement for yourself and for the business either, really, is it? You know, well, we're, access, we're right? Big. So, That's so big. yeah, they, they've watched us over the years. So we've had this unfettered access as a search firm to the venture capitalists and the private equity people and the CEOs, and we've gained their trust over the years because of the search business and building their organizations. Because trust and competency is really the apex predator in search. Well, once they got that, and now they knew that we wanted to tell their story, they knew it was not going to be gotcha TV, that it was going to be legitimate, provocative, transparent storytelling without a side agenda or a nef nefarious, you know, sort of mm, intention. So how can, and I, and I like to do this sort of before we get to the end, because obviously you'll know yourself content of podcasts and, and YouTube, people take it in small bites and maybe just start and possibly get to the end. Right now, I'd like to give you an opportunity for, to give us some contact information if anybody is interested in finding out more about your businesses. Sure. Um, so it's uh, joemullings.com. Um, I have a pretty, pretty robust following on LinkedIn where we get to do a lot of things and get to share a lot of thoughts. Uh, so Joe Mullings on LinkedIn. Uh, and you can look us up also at TMG360, which is our media company. Yep. and themullingsgroup.com. So there's a whole bunch for you, but you can find all those on joemullings.com. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I've, got a, I've got an interesting question for you. How do you sure. go about recruiting your own staff? <sighs> very carefully. Um, <laughs> very, very carefully. Yeah, I, you know, I put something out on LinkedIn today that talks about culture. We just came back from a, a weekend event we have every year called Meeting of the Minds, where we get all 45 of our team members together. Um, and, you know, people talk about protecting culture and we believe anything you protect, you make weak. Um, and so what we make sure is we put stress on our culture uh, and then have it respond and get stronger. Now to do that though, we hire people who are smart, conscientious, curious, uh, have incredible integrity, um, put uh, team before self, uh, and have demonstrated all those things evidence-based either through testing on, you know, IQ and personality testing, but also past experiences. And probably most importantly is we want to find a massive dose of adversity you had to go through and then you came out the other side different. Yeah. Um, and we want that before you come to us at somebody else's expense, because then we kind of see who you are from a carbon base. And so we make sure that we're very particular on team selection because then once they get in and they're all these sovereign individuals, but when you take people with those qualities and you let them all know that this is an environment that will cater to their, their, their individual needs, but also they have to serve the team, you get an amazing organization that can, they're, that's, they're just force multipliers is what they are. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very difficult. I do, I do a lot of work on a consultancy basis in the legal sector. And um, it's fascinating when you get people who are obviously in the same regard. You're, in, you're recruiting people who are intelligent, who are often the best in their field, um, but trying to get them to work cohesively. There's a classic line about lawyers. It's a bit like you know, managing a law firm is like herding cats. And, and, it, and it can be in the creative world, can be very much like that as well. So I think that the care you take, time well spent. <laughs> So, when well, you get yeah, but you, you know how you herd cats, yeah. you move their food. And so if you make the food, the reward, 
and you select the right cats that are allowed to stray, you actually want them to stray yeah. because that's where they grow. As long as they stray in the same direction yeah. and then that bowl of food that you move, you can get them all to come to the food, but that food has to be, how are they becoming better because they're part of the team? Yeah. That's the food. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing quite a bit of work at the moment with OKRs um, and um, read the book probably a bit late to the party but i can't i read the book by john Doe, measure what matters um yeah. i've I found that a very helpful sort of help to me to sort of like guide me through i mean have you have you put pen to paper yet or, or fingered a keyboard and created your own tomb of, of what how to do it or you think um i have over the years i've been asked when's the book coming out uh anything i've ever written and pu put out in the public domain is in a folder somewhere we right. had started with some intention about two years ago start writing a book um thankfully we stopped because it wouldn't have been the book i wanted to put out yeah. uh but there is a collective right now that we're putting together and it will be something that we'll want to share but gosh i'm still learning so much right now that uh, you know I, i'd already be thinking about book two when book one is not even out yet it's okay we're gonna make a whole series out of it i mean and, and you could obviously put it to film as well you probably get to play yourself in the movie um what i what i brad pitt, uh, what, brad pitt yeah one of the uh, one of the ideas that, um, that that come across from a lot of the, the things that you can the creativity is around storytelling, and that's one of the elements of of the uh, the John Doerr book about with OKRs and his work at Intel, but then subsequently the other companies that have adopted the OKR process at Google and and and, um, but that's something that comes across very strongly within your business. Can you perhaps give me some examples of how you've used storytelling to help promote a client or your own business? Well, sure. Um, look, storytelling, we love stories. That's how, that's how information has been passed down over the years, right? Around campfires with people scratching animals on a wall and telling the story before we capture them in written and now, you know, in video and online. Um, so you, you, always have, you always have to have a dragon. You always have to have a cave that the dragon lives in, right? Then you have to have a hero. And then that hero has to be a faulty person who then overcomes his or her own faults on their way to becoming, you know, the, 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 the hero who saves whatever it is that needs to be saved, right? We all go, you can unwind every single movie that way or any, any single fable that's oh, ever been told, uh, yeah. right? And so we look at that as we talk about clients and, and why do I wanna leave behind? What is it that I'm not getting where I am right now? Who's the dragon or what's the dragon or what's the disease state that's the dragon that we're trying to overcome, especially in med tech, yeah. right? How, how are people doing it today and how can we do it better? And then ultimately the overlaying answer that needs to be given in every story is who will I become along the way? Who will I become? And, and we, we explain that to our clients and, and it does come down to what your career is and what your job is, because they're different. Jobs and careers are different. Is you need to look forward about if I join that team, if I join that tribe, who will I become intellectually, spiritually, physically, economically? Who will I become? And show me evidence along the way of why I can potentially become that there. And that's what we tell all of our clients. And it's you know, because obviously you're focusing on the the key the key element, and of of with um, a content creation. I'm just thinking now about the various mediums out there now. In a digital world, you know, we are awash with various different mediums to, to, to go to, whether it be on social media platforms or whether it be sort of short, long term variations by way of YouTube or by podcasting. Is there a medium? that springs to mind when I, when you think about how you see companies not using it properly and mm. far too much of that, where, where actually they could make so, so much more impact if they were doing it properly. Yeah. Well, it's a chorus of efforts, really. There's not one silver bullet. You know, there's too many organizations I think that are out there that said, well, we're gonna put out this 13 minute signature video that's gonna tell our story and we're gonna put it out and just wait. Yeah. And then everybody's gonna come. And invariably, you know, it's got three views and nobody sits through it to your point unless it's madly, madly, you know, entertaining. And then you're in the wrong business if it's that madly entertaining. Yeah. 
And so I think it's a chorus of efforts. I think it's long and short form video. I think it's long and short form copy. Uh, I believe it's on platforms like LinkedIn, like TikTok, um, even like Instagram, because you have to keep in mind that we're different people as we take in each of these platforms. As we, as we look at LinkedIn, we don't want to, if you're on LinkedIn, you'll see it, not proper for LinkedIn, put that on Facebook, right? And so on LinkedIn, that should be an educational platform. On Instagram, it should be an escapism platform. It should be lush pictures. It should feel like a life magazine, right? So, but it's a different message there. And then of course on Facebook, it's connect and engage and alumnus and family. So that's a different story there. And then on Twitter, well, Twitter's just a mob scene. You know, I'm not a fan of Twitter. Um, and uh, it's, but it's bubblegum news, if you will. And yeah. it's a way to have a signal out there. So I think organizations are now, the early movers are now getting an understanding of it's a chorus of efforts. It's not social media. Those are the platforms that they just happen to be on and you can't treat them like that. Uh, and you need to hire teams that are not your Marcom teams, that are not your public relations teams, but they're people who understand how to tell really short stories, again, in video and copy, and make it an ongoing story. It's not just a moment in time that you think yeah. you're gonna influence a market. You've gotta be in there. And we, we, we coined this, it's a hum, sing, shout approach. There needs to be a constant hum all the time of signaling, then there's gotta be a sing on, which is a bit of a higher amplitude, maybe less of a frequency. And then a shout is a very high amplitude and much lower frequency. And you put all those out and you keep that bat signal on 24 seven. Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. I love that. I mean, of course, in the backdrop of all this and, and the development of your companies, which which I think, did I read that you're I don't know if you've expanded outside of your your office space, or you were about to. Yeah. About, about we're to uh, we're we're the UK, we're question. Canada, we're Cleveland. I'm going to Israel next week uh, to scout out there. Boston coming up, um, so that's where we are right now. Um, but you know, there's still still a lot of real estate and world left to uh, impact. So that's all very very positive. But a lot of companies have had challenges because of what's happened in the last couple of years with with the pandemic. I don't want to spend huge amounts of time on it, but it has had a massive impact on the recruitment industry. Yes. How have, how have you seen that uh, impact affect your own business and how have you adapted to, to make it? Because obviously, clearly, you're making it work for you because this great, great resignation may have been a great opportunity or you're, maybe it's the, it's the wrong, it's the different area that you're, that you're dealing with, different people, different aspirations. Mm. Mm. Well, it, it made me look at, maybe look at something from a totally different angle you know historically before january 2020 if you asked me remote employees i'd say no not a chance you can't you can't run our business remote you've got to be in, in in the in the nest uh and then we started a piece much like you started your podcast called the other side during the middle of COVID, which really birthed this studio and it was, what's it going to look like on the other side? And I interviewed very influential CEOs in the med tech, health tech industry. And as I listened to them, they had perspectives on things that started to make me sit back and go, okay, there are other ways. Yeah. And so what we've done is, and, and what early movers have done is say, okay, there's other ways. There's, there's, you've got to adjust your game plan. You've got to change your business plan. Um, but your teammates need to also have patience with you. So what's happened right now is the employee is now in more charge than ever in the history of work than the employer. The worker is more powerful than ever before. Yeah. But having said that, they, they, can't, they can't over index how much power they have because then what they're going to do is they're gonna create a dilemma on the employer's side because every employer's business plan was three to five years and never included a pandemic. So their spend on their real estate, their spend on their infrastructure, their spend on their tech was built for a pre-January 2020 environment. But the worker feels like he or she is, it's the time for them to get square, to get even as a collective, not everybody, but as a collective. And so now they've got to work together and they could together can, can create a much better professional work environment and, and be able to, in a healthy way, integrate 
not balance, because there's no such word as balance, integrate work and life and learn how to integrate those and understand that everybody might dial it in differently now before you only had one or two choices. Now there's upwards of a dozen choices of what that integration looks like. And so, you know, I just don't believe that the construct of the world of work in early 2020, that was a knee jerk reaction, like I call it as a punch in the throat. Was that our best reflex of action at the time? Well, it was the one we had, but is it the best move from both perspectives moving forward that needs to be examined? Yeah. And do you feel it? I mean, a lot of work that you do is in the C-suite with, with senior executives in the meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, do you find that the re the time for reflection that was being suggested as part of the great resignation has impacted those roles as much as it's affected the rest of the population? Has that been has there been a lot of churn in in those areas? I, I, I've seen. It's interesting you ask that question. I've seen some sudden resignations at a higher rate in the C suite, and I don't know if those were self selected because there was a higher calling for them to go out and spend the rest of their life in a different way or or the boards um, and the other shareholders saying you're not the person to move us forward um, for where the world is going um, here's a nice package see you later but we never find the truth out in the public domain for stock price reasons uh, and investor reasons so I have seen there and I've seen some really reflective CEOs um, and certain business models demand that their workers come back and it's very appropriate. Yeah. And I've seen in other business models that they're not demanding the workers to come back and it's very appropriate. You know, when you have these high security, high compliance, heavy manufacturing, you've got to be there because you're making a product and you're asking your workers to come back. It's for their own health. It's almost like, I'm, I'm probably going to catch some flack for this. It's almost like a parent with a child who can see a much broader perspective of, I can't give you candy seven days in a row yeah. because it's not going to work out well. Yeah. And it's the same thing with some of the work from home or work from work or some blend therein. They've got to keep a bigger picture on everything. And that CEO or that leadership team needs to give enough breathing room for the worker. And the worker has to understand that sometimes, not only for stock price, that the leadership is asking them to come back in for what could potentially happen to them downrange. I, I, I referenced uh, a number of times when in conversation, that one of the skills that uh, I found I, I drew upon as CEO more often than not was that of parenting. <laughs> Just that, you know, in the workplace, you know, mm -hmm. we are all, we are all sort of overgrown children. And I count myself in that regard as well as my wife will testify. Um, but we, we all find ourselves in moments where we're triggered and it might be petulant. It might be quite puerile to 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 you know demand that you work from home or that that you know you're not getting treated the same as such as somebody else because they're actually what they, there was a thing we did here called furlough, which meant that groups of of as you'll be well aware um, m members of staff were able to be at home, get paid, but not necessarily well not do any work. They actually weren't permitted to do any work. Mm -hmm. Seemed like quite well, a it, number. But that it, it, stresses. The, there, there's. There, there's something that's occurred in the last few years, and it's been in the WFX world, and it's been in the, um, uh, the, 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 the use the word equity in the workplace, is there's, you can have a careless compassion that can be very dangerous. And what I mean by that is there are issues in the workplace and in, 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 in the social setting that it's too easy to say, well, if we would just increase our compassion, it would solve the problem. And most of the problems we deal with in society and in the workplace are way more complex than we spend, are willing to spend the time to deconstruct and examine in a non-emotional fashion. Yeah. And there are people who are using compassion, which is careless compassion, with a nefarious intention to either punish the man or stir the pot and ups and flip upside down the equation because they want to bring something in. And so most of the challenges in the workplace, and I'll stay away from the social side because that's a lot more explosive and interpretive on my words, 
is that careless compassion can sink an organization and sink an industry. Because a lot of times just saying, I have X at home that I need to balance out with X in the workplace. And if you had any sense of compassion, you'd understand that. And I think any normal human being who's a leader has that compassion. And they're also able to make sure that they say yes, and things are very complex. I didn't say but because but negates everything that happened before that. I said, and it's very complex. Let's look at this together. And that's why I said a little bit earlier that the worker now has more leverage than ever and they can't trade it away. However, you can't allow just a broad careless compassion to drive what decisions are made and will determine what happens moving forward. Yeah, point well made. And and in, in that regard, I mean, that's one area. Are you seeing any other situations where companies in the, in the med tech field are or, or other areas where they're getting the recruitment process wrong and it's being a sort of the, the sort of repeat offenses across the piece in the light of where we are now well getting it wrong is the rule <laughs> most organizations are really ill-equipped at attracting the right talent um securing the right talent and then retaining the right talent uh, they're, they're quite poor at it and a lot of it is because, and you know, it's because of HR. Now, before the arrows come, let me explain what, what I mean by HR. HR, about 50 or 60 years ago, some president or CEO said, listen, we got to get a bunch of people hired. Let's put an ad in the paper and let's see who applies. And HR, you're in charge of that because you deal with the people inside the organization. The skill sets inside an organization to take care of the family members versus the skill sets in order to invasively go out in today's marketplace and attract talent and tell stories and secure them and then give those individuals a white glove experience as they come through the process are two entirely different skill sets. One's a hunter, one's a gatherer mindset. So that's number one. Number two is HR right now is so overwhelmed and under-resourced to deal with this changing workplace from a safety, a health, a career perspective, figuring out benefits, figuring out this work from anywhere environment. Oh, and by the way, you have to go find us the best people and we're not giving you any extra tools, money, training, or personnel to do that. HR is doomed to foul. Yeah. So it's the CEO's fault. And I have firmly believed for years, and I said it well before the pandemic, that the CEO's um, bonus in large part should be held to hiring brand, retention of personnel, and promotability of personnel within their organization. It, because what we get rewarded for is what we put our attention towards. And I have yet to see a CEO compensation package tied to those three components. And the poor HR department who's sitting there, again, under-resourced, under-trained, and candidly, what they got hired for was taking care of a maternalistic family versus an outward-bound, aggressive, storytelling, recruiting, elite white glove service coming through even if you don't get the job in our company, but you interviewed, you are now the next great apostle to pass the word about. That was an amazing experience. I didn't get the job, but gosh, if another posting comes up or if you're thinking about going to work, that's where you should interview. They'll treat you as an equal or even better. That's where, that's where the mistakes are being made, not putting enough intention, resources, and training in that area. Yeah. And of course, there's, the, the other challenge which you you address on a daily basis in your businesses, in the search business, is where I would imagine the vast majority of the targets, individuals who you have identified as being suitable for a particular role, may purport to be quite happy in their job. Absolutely. The people... I'm not looking, Joe. I'm not looking. I'm fine. I'm absolutely great. I, I'm. I've got a settled here. I'm. I'm. I've got my. I've got my. Got my kids in school. I've got everything sorted out. I don't need to be worrying about finding another job. 
and without giving away your secret sauce, how do you how do you get into the mind? I mean, there must be something that you trigger, and then without mm. obviously being a, <laughs> getting them getting you know, changing their minds completely in a nefarious way. But how how do you tap into that um, mindset where they think actually things aren't as good as they could be? Every great talent acquisition person, any great recruiter, whether it's a recruiter for a football team, and I mean, you know, UK football, American football, baseball, college, any great recruiter knows they can't talk anybody into anything because at the 11th hour, they're going to say, the person's going to say no because the rest of their world is influencing them. A great recruiter is nothing more than a facilitator to help you get to a, a decision of yes or no quickly and transparently. Yeah. Now, what you can do, what you can do as a great recruiter, as a great HR person, as a great talent access individual, is you can longitudinally tell a story and you could put that story, we call it in our firm, attention and awareness. If I call up Sally and Sally's an elite player, she's a one percenter. And I say, Sally, hey, it's Joe again. Or even if it's the first time I talk to Sally. Sally, hi, Joe Mullings from the, the Mullings Group. Joe, I'm happy where I am. Sally, I am ecstatic for you. Sally, if you were looking, what would it look like? What would it look like? Now, I understand what Sally might be interested in hearing about. Along the way, though, now we have a program going on 24-7, 365, and we're telling the stories in the theater of LinkedIn right. and in the theater of email and, and in the theater of in-mail. And we're creating these stories with our clients and watch having people watch with a Coke and popcorn as they sit at their desk. That company telling its story and other people in that company who are telling their story and highlighting the wins of that organization and subliminally answering, who might I become if I really even went to that company? And the number of inbound calls we now get from that one percenter who watches us online and watches our clients online with their content. And that individual is a force multiplier. There's something called Price's Law, where they say the square root of the number of people in your company do 50% of the work. So if I have a 100-person company, 10 people are doing 50%, 90 other people are doing the other 50%. When you pay a good headhunting firm, the headhunting firm always gives you the prices law employee. So if you're a company that wants to bring in an overabundance of prices law employees, you need to start telling these stories at scale online. And you don't need a headhunter to do it. Most organizations should have a media company that is telling their hiring narrative online on who you would become and here's the wins and here are the people. That's the way you get the one percenters. One percenters don't answer job ads. They don't send resumes to HR and they are not easily recruited out on the first shot. Yeah. I mean, that is brilliant. I mean, obviously to have a CEO of an organization with the foresight to be able to think along those lines and obviously helped by your own facilitation, but to, to have that proactivity, with the way they're looking at recruitment, I would say is a must because otherwise they're going to get left behind and fast with the way things are. And they're only going to hire the people who are available in a 30 or 60 day window. So let, let's even pull that string further. Most of the time somebody says, we need a controller. No. We need an accountant. Say, great. Who's available right now? And who do we know? You, well, you don't know who you didn't hire no. and you should be hiring somebody that you've been telling the story to over the last year. And then once you go out to the market, now you're starting to have people lean in who've been watching your story for a long time and potentially saw a gap where they might be able to apply their sims, their selves. I mean, there was a stat, I read um, the Chartered Institute of Personnel, I've got a, a magazine, People Management, and they did a, a survey of satisfaction with recruitment through the pandemic and you know, through lockdowns in the last couple of years. And they were saying that um, at least 60% of respondents were dissatisfied with the senior hires. That they'd made which, oh gosh yeah oh which, that, that that that's that's a reckoning that is yet to come because the number of desperate hires that were made to fill a spot yeah the number of people who demanded a title that they weren't qualified for because they stepped up because there was nobody else at that vice president level that was quote unquote available or good enough so we hired somebody we thought was good enough 
over the next three to five years, there's going to be a terrible reckoning that's going to take place of incompetency promoted beyond its competency. Peace and principle. that is going to crater. Peace principle. I've seen it so many times. Yes. Yeah, it's dangerous. Very, very mm -hmm. dangerous. Joe, we could talk for the rest of the afternoon. I'm sure I'm really enjoying this, but I, I don't want to, I, mean, I know you've got a very busy schedule ahead of you. Um, what I would like to do is just ask one more question. And that is a question which put yourself in the position of being an employee in an organization. I and mean, you've been in this, this spot. You're an employee in an organization would much rather be the employer. Given your experience, what advice might you give somebody who just hasn't quite had the conus to actually do it yet, but but you, they're thinking they want to do it, they're going to do it at some point. But what might you what might you say to them to persuade them to to take that leap? Well, I think the first thing I would say, and that was, I mentioned it when I introduced myself, I became an apprentice before I got into this craft. Um, so, being an entrepreneur. Is, is incredibly challenging, it's incredibly lonely, um, it's incredibly stressful, um, and it's not as romantic as all the Instagrammers say. Yeah. Sometimes being an intrapreneur, building a company within an infrastructure can help mitigate a lot of those unneeded stresses, either financial stress, emotional stress, infrastructure stress. If you're an employee in an organization and you have this, you think, you don't know yet, you think you wanna be an entrepreneur, Consider being an intrapreneur. Consider going to the entrepreneur owner or the CEO, if it's a publicly traded company or it's a corporation, and share with them what your vision is and what your goal is and what you'd like to do and what's in it for them. And then follow that through, obviously, business plans, long conversations. This may take three, six, nine, 12 months to manifest itself. If they say, if, if the leader says no right away, it's probably because you haven't showed enough of a benefit for them. Yeah, But if you show a benefit where there's an expansion of opportunity, I would say be an, entre be an, it's, be an entrepreneur because the psychological and physical and emotional burden of being an entrepreneur, even a wildly successful one, is beyond most people's capacity. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I mean, when I think back to where I was and the way I started out, I actually, I actually followed that path by being recruited by people that I'd previously worked for. It was, it was that sort of symbiosis, that's that sort of link that, that gave me the leg to where I needed to be. So uh, fascinating and on point. Joe, thank you very much for your time today. We've really enjoyed it. I, I'm sure this is going to be one that uh, the listeners are going to have a lot of fun listening back to, uh, a lot of insight. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to be able to share. Thank you.